Good evening and welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. So pleased to have you with us here tonight. This is a series presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in partnership with UC Irvine Health. My name is Adrian Windsor and I am a member of the board of the foundation. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Mike and Polly Smith. Mike and Polly were with us when this idea was first thought up and they have been with us steadfastly ever since the program began. It's now, I think we're maybe in our eighth or ninth year of medicine in our backyard, sharing the resources of UCI with our local community. Before I introduce our speaker, let me just say this. Uh, we will have Q&A at the end, so hold your questions to the end and please use the Q&A box to ask any questions that you have. Let me also say a word about the foundation. We're back in business in person with our witty lectures and our library live lectures, and we invite you to join us for those. Go online to our website and find out more about that. Also, uh, we are a membership group and we have motivation for you to become a member. On the 25th of June, we are celebrating a, our membership with a summer solstice a reception. And this will include food and wine and it will feature Connie Spinoza, the award-winning author of her book, Chocolate Runs Through My Veins. So this will be a very special evening. And if you become a member by June 1st, you will be invited to come and join us for free. So we want to give our members a chance to get to know each other, to come together and be together. And that will be the event that we will be sponsoring on June 25th. Put that on your cal calendar, uh, become a member today, <laughs> okay? All right, now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. William Carnes. Dr. William Carnes is a UCI health gastroenterologist who specializes in disorders of the gastrointestinal tract. He performs colonoscopies, upper endoscopies, capsule endoscopies, and bacterial problems in the small intestines. He also conducts translational research on colon cancer prevention with an emphasis on regular colorectal screening, especially among patients and families with a genetic risk for developing the disease. I suspect if you are in our audience tonight, you have experienced one of these. <laughs> something none of us maybe like to talk about, but something that happens to all of us. Dr. Carnes earned his medical degree from the University of Minnesota Medical School in Minneapolis, where he completed residency in internal medicine. He went on to complete a fellowship in molecular biology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and a fellowship in gastroenterology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Please join me uh, in welcoming Dr. William Carnes for our presentation tonight on how we can prevent colon cancer. Thank you, Dr. Carnes. There, I'm unmuted. Adrian, thank you so much for that really kind introduction. I appreciate it. And thanks for the invitation to give this talk. And this is my passion. And this is the month of my passion. It's uh, March, Colon Cancer Awareness Month. And, you know, the oncologists are in the business of treating colon cancer, uh, making it beatable. I'm in the business of preventing colon cancer altogether. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I know that some of you are kind of anxious to hear about the artificial intelligence as part of all of this. And I'm anxious to also show you. So we'll get started. So colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States among men and women. If there were no smokers among us, it would be number one. Uh, in women, breast is number one. In men, prostate's number one. But uh, colon cancer affects both men and women, and it ends up being uh, number two overall. It is also the most preventable cancer out there. It starts as a benign polyp, which uh, is most typically an adenoma, but there are other types of precancerous polyps. And these polyps have a dwell time that's quite long, typically. It could be 10 years or more before this polyp is going to turn into cancer, which provides us a unique 
window of opportunity to take this out before it ever has a chance. The prevalence of these adenomas is estimated to be over 50% in people over age 50. So 50-50 chance over age 50, you'll have at least one of these. Any polyp removed can't become this, which is what we don't want. That's colon cancer. Colonoscopy with polypectomy has been shown in numerous studies to reduce the incidence of colorectal cancer by up to 90%. And the bottom line here is leave no polyp behind. So again, remove this tiny little two and a half millimeter polyp before it turns into this four inch to five inch cancer. So effective prevention requires effective screening. So you need a way to find the polyps. You need a way to find cancer early. What screening test should you choose? When should you start? How often should you do it? Well, the answer depends on your risk. So it's important that we all understand our risk. We know our risk and then do the appropriate screening relative to that risk. So there are many things we have no control over in terms of risk. For example, how long have we been on the planet? Oops, sorry. Our age. What's our family history? Did our dad, did our mom have colon cancer? Did a couple of second degree relatives have colon cancer? Genetics is part of that. Um, and there are cancer related genes that you can inherit that give you a very high risk of colorectal cancer. Gender and race are also important. And then there are things that we, it's just the way we live our life that affects our risk for colon cancer. For example, we may be overweight. We may have diabetes. We may smoke. We may not eat the best diet. We may not be active enough. We may have inflammatory bowel disease and we're not keeping it under good control. And then there's probably a huge number of other unknown risk factors that affect our risk for colon cancer. So here's how gender and age plays a role in the rate of colon cancer per 100,000 people. So you can see that it really starts to rise in the 40s and 50s for both women and men. And this resulted in a screening start age of 50 years old. This has been around for about 30 years now. Uh, you start your colonoscopy or start your screening at age 50. Well, this has resulted in a beautiful 30% reduction in colorectal cancer um, in the people that are old enough to get screening. But among those who are not eligible for screening, there's been a 20% increase in colorectal cancer, the so-called young onset colon cancer. So it makes no sense to just base it on age. What, what should we do here? Should we just lower the age or should we find some other risk factors? Well, for now, we've just lowered the screening age to age 45. So this is when you start screening for colorectal cancer at age 45. So clearly one size doesn't fit all. I'm, I know there's more to this than just age alone. We need to figure out what the other risk factors are. Um, so, Race is important, as you can see, for males and females, the incidence of colorectal cancer is highest in African Americans, next uh, whites, next Asians, next um, Hispanics. And um, also genetics is important. So today, on average, 287 people will be diagnosed in, with colon cancer. Of these, 190 will tell me I have no family history of colon cancer. I was caught by complete surprise. 77 will say, yeah, my dad had colon cancer or my mom had colon cancer or I had a couple of uncles or something on my mother's side that had colon cancer. That represents just 77 out of this 287 people. And then a much smaller percentage will actually have a gene responsible for their increased risk for colon cancer. That's about 20 out of 20 per day. And, um, but if you look at all the people in the United States that have no family history, their lifetime risk of getting a colon cancer is only 5%, about one in 20. Uh, the lifetime risk if they have a family history is 10%. And the lifetime risk if they, have a gen if they have a gene, depends on the gene, could be as high as 100%. So here's, some, here's an example of some genetic syndromes. This is familial adenomatous polyposis. So 
by the time you're in your 20s, you already have hundreds to maybe even thousands of these precancerous polyps in your colon. You have an inevitable risk to get colon cancer if your colon's not removed uh, by age 70. Um, Lynch syndrome, which affects one in 300 people, that's amazingly common. It's more common than the BRCA gene for breast cancer in women. Um, affects, or it affects one in 300. They have about a 60 to 70, sometimes up to even 80% chance of getting a colon cancer in their lifetime. And then for those that have a family history of colon cancer, which represents about five to 10% of the population, you can see where that curve is relative to these others. And here's the average risk population that have no family history of colon cancer. So for FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis, we start screening at age 20. For Lynch syndrome, we start screening at age 25. For family history of colon cancer, we start at age 40. And now with average risk, the average risk population, we start at age 45. And again, Lynch syndrome is really important. It's estimated that over 30,000 people have Lynch syndrome in the LA basin and 80% of them are completely unaware of their high risk. So what about factors we have no control over? I mean, that we have complete control over, I should say. For example, this guy on the left has chosen to not exercise. He's obese, he drinks too much, he smokes too much, he has type two diabetes, and he eats too much red meat. This guy has a over two and a half fold increased risk of colorectal cancer compared to the average population. And his lifetime risk of getting a colon cancer is 14% if he has no family history and 25 to 27% if he does have a family history. Whereas over here, these guys who exercise, they take an aspirin a day, they get plenty of folate, fiber, um, calcium, and fruit and vegetables in their diet. They avoid the, the processed meats, et cetera. Their risk is 0.6 times the average risk in the United States for getting colon cancer. And the risk with no family history is only 3% and it's 6% if they do have a family history. So these modifiable risk factors are really important, but they are not accounted for in our screening guidelines. So <clears throat> what are your screening options? Well, it really depends on your risk. And you just simply take this test to figure out what your risk is today. Um, I know we're going to come up with better models for predicting risk, but this is what we have today. Do you have a family history of colon cancer? Do you have a personal history of colon polyps or a personal history of colon cancer? Or do you actually have a cancer-related gene syndrome? Or do you have none of the above? If you have any of these, you're considered high risk or very high risk. If you have none of the above, you're considered low or average risk. Now, if you fit into this category here, your screening options are, you have options. You can either do colonoscopy and get the polyps removed, or you can do fit tests or color guard tests, um, and, which are tests that help you find cancer before it causes symptoms, and hopefully early enough that you can be cured with surgery. Whereas if you're high risk, your only choice really is colonoscopy. So if you're average risk, what are your screening goals? So you could either do a FIT test or a Cologuard test or a colonoscopy. It really depends on what your goals are. Is it to prevent colon cancer altogether? Is it to find it early before it has a chance to kill you? Or are you gonna wait? So with colon cancer, as you know, once a polyp, which is benign, makes that transition to a cancer, it goes through stages and it depends on how much that cancer is invaded. If it's a fairly early stage, like a stage two, you have greater than a 90% chance that surgery is gonna cure you. If it has spread off to the neighboring lymph nodes, but it hasn't gotten out of the, the cat's not out of the bag, it hasn't gotten to the liver or the lungs, then your chances of uh, five-year survival are still pretty good, 70%. But if you wait until it's already spread, your five-year survival is less than 12%. So your choices here, if you really wanna prevent colon cancer, get a colonoscopy. Remove the polyps before they ever have a chance to jump this bridge. If your primary goal is, hey, I'm gonna flip my 20-sided coin. 
I don't, you know, I have a 19 out of 20 chance I'm not going to get colon cancer as an average risk person. Uh, but if I do get it, I just want to make sure that I find it early. Then you do the FIT test. If the FIT test or the Cologuard test is positive, then you get a colonoscopy to find out if it's a false positive or not. If a cancer is found, you get surgery. If you wait for symptoms, there's over a 50-50 chance that it's already going to be a late stage cancer. So that's not such a good choice, although it's still only a 19 out of 20 chance that that's going to happen to you. So um, that's how you make your choice on screening. And the bottom line is these all have to go through colonoscopy. Uh, so when should you start screening? Well, if you have a family history of colon cancer affecting a family member who's less than 70, start at age 40 or 10 years younger than the age of the diagnosis of your relative, whichever is younger. If you have a known cancer-related gene, find out from your genetic counselor when should you start screening or your gastroenterologist. It really depends on what gene you have. And if you have none of the above, start at age 45. And how often should you repeat your screening? If you have a family history of colon cancer, do it every five years. If you have a personal history of colon polyps, it really depends on what's found on your colonoscopy each time. And your colonoscopist or your gastroenterologist will help guide you on how, what your interval should be. If you have a personal history of cancer, you do your next colonoscopy one year later after your surgery, then three years after that, and then every five years after that. If you have a known gene, ask your genetic counselor. Uh, in many cases, it's every year or every two years. If it's none of the above, hey, as long as no, nothing's found in your colon, all you need is a colonoscopy every 10 years, do your FIT test or do a FIT test every year, or do your Cologuard every two years. Bottom line here is let your colon do the talking. So can we eliminate colorectal cancer in Orange County and beyond? <clears throat> when I was brought into UCI by Dr. Chang, this was, this was my task. He told me, this is what I want you to do. And I said, okay. <laughs> Well, the goal is achievable. We can prevent 90% of colorectal cancers if we reduce our modifiable risk factors, if we screen with the right tests at the right times based on our risk, and if our colonoscopist is a darn good colonoscopist. In other words, they truly leave no polyp behind. And then among the rest where you know, we do the screen and we do find a cancer, we found it early and we have state-of-the-art treatment and the chances that you're going to survive that cancer are very good. So what are the gaps in this realizing this goal? The current age-based screening guidelines are just not where they need to be. We need to come up with better we know, uh, risk models to say when you should start screening. Many people are unaware of their risk or their options for screening. Many have limited access to appropriate services. And the services ex vary extremely in their quality, especially with colonoscopy. So what, why do we even talk about colonoscopy quality? Well, it's because there's a thing called interval colon cancers. So 91 to 95% of colorectal cancers that are diagnosed today are diagnosed in people who are not up to date with their colonoscopy. But that also means that five to 9% of colorectal cancers are diagnosed in people who are up to date. We call these interval cancers and we wanna know why. That means in a typical career of maybe 20 or 30,000 colonoscopists or colonoscopies, I'm gonna to fail to prevent 120 uh, cancers. And I don't want to fail to prevent any colorectal cancers. So what are the possible explanations for these interval cancers? Well, it could be that I did miss a polyp or I missed a cancer when I did your colonoscopy. It could be that I found the polyp, but I didn't remove it completely. It could be that the pathologist told me your polyp was a nothing when it was actually a something. And it could be that the day after I did your colonoscopy, you made a polyp that just decided it wanted to be a little faster in turning into a cancer than the interval that I gave you until your next colonoscopy. It's estimated that 85% of these interval cancers are my fault as your colonoscopist, that I missed polyps, or I missed a cancer, or I didn't remove those polyps completely. 
So how do we measure a colonoscopy, a colonoscopist's um, quality, their ability to find these and remove these polyps, to leave no polyp behind? Well, the best measure we have today is adenoma detection rate, which I call our batting average, the colonoscopist batting average. And the adenoma detection rate is the fraction of screening colonoscopies in which we find at least one adenoma. As I told you before, the prevalence of adenomas is estimated to be over 50% in the screening age population. And yet colonoscopists vary all over the place in how often they actually find these adenomas, ranging from as low as 7% to as high as 54%. And it's this gap between how many or how often the colonoscopist can actually find adenomas that are there versus you know, the actual prevalence that uh, represents missed adenomas. And these are missed opportunities to prevent colon cancer. And in fact, Corley and then Kaminsky in a separate paper, large studies showed that for every 1% increase a colonoscopist can achieve in their ADR, the risk that their patient will get an interval cancer is reduced by three to 6%. So you bring this up, then it's dramatic. So how do we close these gaps? Well, we need to develop new technologies and techniques to improve ADR, adenoma detection rate. It'd be nice to develop some models to help predict the risk so we can do personalized screening. We need to reach everyone at risk, assess everyone for their risk, educate everyone about their option, about their risk as well as their options to reduce their risk, and then ease the navigation toward the appropriate risk-lowering services, and then provide everyone with the top quality risk-lowering services. So when I came to UCI with this task, UCI had great gastroenterologists, great colorectal surgeons, great oncology, but we had no home for the high-risk people with the genetic syndromes, and we had no measures of our colonoscopy quality. So we had no measures. We weren't measuring ADR, for example. So my task first was to fill this gap and make sure we're the, we, we can provide. I'm gonna turn this green. So I created the high risk clinic in 2015 um, with this comprehensive genetic database. We've seen over 3,500 new patients so far. We've made 377 new genetic diagnoses with 500 affected family members with these high risk uh, cancer related genes. We're now operating at a capacity that's 95%, uh, we're, we're completely booked, and 95% of our, our referrals are just within UCI. And we're three months out now in our new appointments, so we clearly need to build on this, increase our capacity to start providing for the 50,000 or you know, 30 to 50,000 affected uh, people out in the LA basin, and we need more counselors. So I also created a colonoscopy quality database where we collected information in real time on every colonoscopy, including every polyp, their pathology, et cetera, for, all, for each of our colonoscopists. Uh, now has over 15,000 colonoscopies and 25,000 polyps in it with all these images and polyps, uh, polyps, et cetera. And then started to create a dashboard to provide each of the colonoscopists some feedback on their key quality measures. And just in doing so, since starting it in 2000, oops, sorry, in 2012 to 2014, we um, increased our adenoma detection rate by, this is, uh, looks like about 9%, which would be predicted to reduce the risk of interval colon cancers by 24 to 48%. I teach a lot of colonoscopies at UCI. And one of the things I've noticed is that, you know, it's important, you know, it's important to look behind every nook and cranny, spend your time during withdrawal, look for these polyps. But some fellows I've noticed can have a polyp right in front of their face and they don't see it. And the question is, you know, is this a pattern recognition thing? What's going on? And so I leveraged the database that we had with all these pictures of polyps, worked with uh, Pierre Baldi at UCI, and then later with a startup company called DocBot, and trained the, an artificial intelligence to recognize polyps in real time 
during colonoscopy to draw little boxes around polyps while we're doing the procedure so that for those of us who do have a hard time to see that this is a polyp, we'll have the help of the AI to say, yes, it is a polyp. And this is just an example of what it looks like in real time. And we've got three rooms running at UCI right now where we have the AI running on all of our colonoscopies. So there, the a here's the AI picking up on this polyp. And that polyp up there is a sessile serrated polyp. The one next to it is a smaller polyp. And then just as we pull back this fold, you can see another polyp. And the most subtle of all polyps is a sessile serrated polyp, which is very flat, often just covered with a blob of mucus like you just saw. And you can see my mouse. This polyp is actually spread out about over this area. And the AI can pick up at least part of it. So on top of just polyp detection, we've developed algorithms from this database for polyp characterization. So now we have artificial intelligence that can just look at the polyp and tell us what kind it is, how big it is, what its shape is. It can count polyps. In other words, it knows that that was polyp A and this one's polyp B, and so it can count them. Uh, it knows what tools we're using to remove the polyp. We're working on algorithms to detect incomplete removal of polyps, uh, to detect complete colonoscopy. In other words, did we actually get to the top of the colon or did we miss some real estate? And to measure how much time we're spending on inspection coming out. Um, and then we're developing algorithms to actually tell us or give us feedback on parts of the colon, like behind folds and things that we didn't see. And then the quality of the prep of the colon, trying to entice us to clean the colon better so we can uh, see the, the surface of the colon better. We've even developed severity inflammatory um, scoring for inflammatory bowel disease. And this is a list of 35 publications that we've had on artificial intelligence since 2017, including four uh, presentations coming up at uh, the Digestive Disease Week in San Diego in 2022. So I think we've got this green now, and now we need to work on, on this other part before we have something to market and go out and reach the population. We need to assess risk, educate people on their risk, and navigate to uh, risk-lowering services. And the concept is what I call an Aaron concept, the assess risk, educate, and navigate. So the idea is it's just an app. You can get, get at it through your computer or your, or your iPhone or your Android. It's a simple survey that asks the key questions related to modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for colon cancer. It then gives you some feedback on what your risk is, um, provides guideline recommendations related to that risk. And then it also allows you to mess around with some of the risks that you put into your survey to say, for example, what if I quit smoking, what would happen? Oh. What would happen if I didn't eat so much processed meat? What would happen if I exercised more, if I stopped smoking or, you know, the, the whole thing? What if I did a colonoscopy? So you can learn a lot just by this interactive uh, process. And then one button navigation to a provider, a provider, a top quality provider. So that's the concept. And then the concept is, you know, whatever you put into your, um, to your um, survey is an assessment of risk. And that can be compared to what actually is found on your colonoscopy. If these data are both going into the cloud, and then we also have the thousands and thousands of data points that are in the electronic medical record, all being compared to what was actually found on the colonoscopy, then we can come up with a, we can use machine learning to actually find new risks new fingerprints of risk for whether you do or you don't have a precancerous polyp right now, and then continuously update the model and get better and better and better. So that's, that's where we're heading next. And then if we enter the genome into this, then we've really got something. So the priorities at this point is develop and validate novel AIs, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms, to improve colonoscopy quality, get an AI machine in every room, 
expand our high-risk clinic to market the 30 to 50,000 uh, cases of uh, people with genetic syndromes in the LA basin, uh, develop this ERIN concept so we can screen everyone, maybe identify the, the undiagnosed Lynch syndromes. Um, we anticipate huge downstream benefits for both UCI, our patients and their families, and then further develop this personalized risk assessment tool uh, by linking colonoscopy, the colonoscopy database, the EPIC, you know, that, which is our electronic medical record, and genomics uh, so that we can develop a precise and personalized risk assessment uh, to guide screening. So it's no longer one size fits all age 45, that's it. So I'm, I think I'm done with the talk. So here's, we're not here yet, all not, it's not all green, but this is where I hope to be in maybe five to 10 years. So that concludes my talk and I'm gonna open this up to discussion. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Carnes. Uh, we have a, a few questions here for you. And I, I think what you're telling us is we need really to be responsible, don't we? I mean, yes. yeah. This is something, unless you take charge for yourself, you're not really going to know. Yep. But everybody's so different in their attitudes toward that. You know, some people may look at that one in 20 chance of getting a colon cancer and say, hey, I hate colonoscopy so much. I hate doctors so much. I'm just going to flip my 20 sided coin and go with the. 19 out of 20 that nothing's ever going to happen to me. <laughs> uh, well, we have a question here. What about colonoscopies after you're 80 years old? Um, it depends on your history, your risks. Um, for average risk people, um, the guidelines are saying you can stop at 75. Um, my guideline is I stop when you don't think you've got 10 years left. How do we know that? <laughs> we don't. <laughs> uh, we have a question here about how useful are the swallowed encapsulated cameras? Um, there, is a, there is a pill camera. It's about the size of my pinky right there. Um, it has a camera on each end, so it looks in both directions. It's uh, designed to, to look at your colon. Um, the... You know, the good thing about it is that, that it, you know, it has two lenses. If your colon's clean enough, it should be able to find a polyp. The bad news is if the adenoma prevalence is truly 50% and it finds all those 50%, then 50% 50 of the people that take the capsule are going to require a colonoscopy anyway. And the second is the prep is really tough because it's, twice as rigorous as a, col as a colonoscopy prep because the capsule can't clean as it looks around. It's just stuck what, with what it's got. Whereas when I'm doing colonoscopy, I've got a water jet, I've got a vacuum and I can get everything really spotless. Um, so yeah, my, my attitude about it is if a colonoscopy cannot be completed because the colon is too long, it's got too many twists and turns, um, then the capsule makes sense. If you just have total disdain for the whole concept of doing colonoscopy and your average risk, the capsule makes sense. But just keep in mind the capsule can't do anything about what it finds. It can only tell you what's there. And it's probably not perfect at doing that. So it doesn't, it doesn't educate and it doesn't navigate. <laughs> <laughs> it does not navigate. And it certainly can't remove your polyps, not yet. Uh, uh, someone is asking, is UCI the only place that's using the artificial intelligence? Well, um, there's, uh, there's three major players in the world developing polyp detection uh, algorithms. One of them is being marketed through Medtronic and is already out there. Um, it comes from a large pharmaceutical company that developed it in Italy. Uh, so Medtronic has, uh, has a system that's up and running and doctors can pay for it. Um, we don't have FDA clearance for ours yet. We're working on getting the um, clinical studies done so we can do that. There's, a, there's also a group, oh, there's two more companies too in the world that uh, have something going on. There's one out of um, MIT and there's one out of China. 
Okay. So this is this is the future, isn't it? Really, uh, it's part of it. Part of the future. Yeah. I, you know, it's it's, you know, when we first um, realized that adenoma detection rate was so important, we started figuring out well, how can we get better, and then we developed little devices to put on the tip of the scope to pull the folds back while we come out, and that improved our adenoma detection rate by fifteen or twenty percent. And then the artificial intelligence is looking like it's improving our adenoma detection rate by 20 some percent. Um, you know, it's a com maybe a combination of all these things is gonna get all of us up to an adenoma detection rate of 50% or higher, which is what we as patients would expect from our colonoscopist. So how do we evaluate colonoscopists? <laughs> How do, how do we know if we're going to the right physician for this procedure? It's, it's tough because you don't know. It's, it's not something that all colonoscopists measure. You know, what's my adenoma detection rate? It's not something that's publicly available to anyone. So, you know, one of the advantages to an artificial intelligence system that can detect the polyp, tell you what kind of polyp it is, and then also to say whether you removed it or not, can also automatically determine what your adenoma detection rate is. And then that, that becomes something that you don't even have to hassle with to try to get that information. Okay. Um, we have someone here who's asking with a family history of colon cancer, a colonoscopy last year had a suspicious polyp removed with the recommendation to do another one in three years. Should it be done sooner? Well, it depends on the polyp, but um, we classify, you know, we, the three year interval is usually when there's an advanced adenoma, like it's bigger than a centimeter or it has some high grade dysplasia, which is that early change toward cancer, or it has this villus uh, feature that the pathologist sees in the polyp, then it's a three year interval. If you have more than three adenomas of any size, it's a three year interval. So yeah, it makes sense. Three years makes sense. Okay. Uh, what about the relationship between colon cancer and diverticulitis? No relationship. No relationship whatsoever. Okay, no. that probably. Yeah, it, it's just that when you do have diverticulitis, um, you never know for sure whether it's actually caused by a perforated colon cancer or diverticulitis. So very frequently after your first case of diverticulitis, we wait for it to cool down and we do a colonoscopy just to make sure it's just straightforward diverticulitis and not a colon cancer. Okay, so it's distinguishing between yeah. two. Um, here's someone who had an incomplete polyectomy for a large fragile polyp, which had been bleeding for some time. And the, gastroenterologist is waiting for half a year to redo it. Uh, does that sound reasonable to wait six months? It depends on what the pathologist said about the parts of the polyp that were removed, because that gives you information about how potentially aggressive it might be. So if it was just a, like a tubular adenoma, that's, I would say that's probably fine. Six months is probably okay. Um, but you know, I don't have enough information to really, uh, to, to know whether it would have been what I would have said or you know, the next colonoscopist, what they would have said. <laughs> you can't diagnose for someone else, especially right. when you haven't seen the patient yourself. Um, you talked about the gene counselors and someone is wanting to know where they get the gene testing. Um, well, in our high-risk clinic, uh, our, we have a genetic counselor, her name is Deepika Nathan. And um, she, you know, we, we either do it with a blood test or just a spit test. After she talks to you, she figures out which of the, it's, they're usually tests that have a battery of genes in them, but they're kind of focused on um, whatever your family history is telling her, you know, what kinds of genes she might be thinking about. So she's got a, a number of different gene batteries from different companies that she can send the specimen to. Um, 
but yeah, that's how it's done. It's you go to a you go to a genetic counselor. They listen to what you have to say. They figure out what they think the most likely genes would be. They make sure they order a test that has all the genes that they want in it, and then um, and then it's usually just done with spit or just a quick blood test. Okay. Um, we have a question here about the high risk in people of African descent. Uh, is it is it anything related to diet even in the different groups? We don't we don't know for sure um, whether it's diet, whether it's you know genetic in some way, um, whether it has more to do with just access to care. Um, in that they're not getting their colonoscopies, they're not getting their polyps out, they're not getting, and then they end up with colon cancer more frequently. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's certainly a lot of uh, inequities in, in um, the way care is provided across, you know, different uh, types of people. So, you know, I think it's, nobody knows the answer for sure. Nobody knows. And it, as I commented at the beginning, this really requires us to be very responsible for ourselves and, and to take the action that we need to take. Uh, I'm curious, what kind of background do these genetic counselors have? Are, are they a type of physician? No, they're not physicians. Um, they have their own degree. Uh, they go through, uh, I think, a two-year two program. Like uh, Deepika Nathan is an instructor in our genetic program at UCI, and she has genetic counselors, uh, students mm -hmm. um, who rotate with her in my high risk clinic, for example. Um, so every Tuesday morning at our Costa Mesa clinic, you know, I've got Deepika there and I've got her student for that month. And um, and then they, you know, after a couple of years, then they go out and get a job. It's a field perhaps we should educate people about more so that they know yes. that it's available and how necessary it is. All right. Well, that seems to conclude the questions that we have tonight. I'd like to thank you so much for coming and in sharing this information with us. You will be contributing to the health of this community. We know that going forward. Well, thank you so much. Uh, was recorded and this will be available on our website, on our YouTube channel. So uh, if tell your friends about it if they weren't able to attend tonight. And let me say that our next event is with Dr. Krishnansu Tawari, who will be presenting a talk on women surviving cancer, why treatment at a designated cancer center matters. So, we are going to take responsibility for ourselves going forward. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Have a perfect week. And we look forward to having you with us again at the end of April. Good night.